So, so today we're looking at the ethics of care, and this is a relatively new moral theory. Um, in certain respects, some parts of it are not that new, but the way it's put together as a whole and the different emphases that it has is relatively new. And it gets started, you could say, really with feminist moral theory um, coming out of the 1960s and 1970s and starts to take real determinative shape in the 1980s and 1990s which for us um, is already historical, isn't it? Um, one of the things that you notice when you're reading these, these two articles that they sent you, the, uh, Virginia Helm and the uh, um, Rosemary Tong articles, is they're writing about all these things that have to be done and, and uh, feminist transformations of moral theory, but they're writing about it 20 years ago. So. Actually, a little bit more than 20 years ago, the Held Articles from 1990. This is before a lot of you were born. And I brought this up to the last class. You know, did, if, if feminism is in large part about taking women's concerns and experiences into account, fully into account, are they the same for your generation as they were, say, for your, your parents' generation or your grandparents' generation? Um, think about some of the, the changes in advances that have been made. Um, you women in the class, does anybody ever call you a co-ed? You ever heard that term? Probably heard it, right? 40 years ago, all of you would have been co-eds because you would have been marked as unusual by being a woman in a college classroom. Um, nowadays, there's actually more female college students than there are male college students. In, in your generation, there are more women in college than there are men in college. And female graduation rates are higher than male graduation rates. Um, so things have changed in some respects. Um, you, I'm not going to actually ask for a show of hands, but think about how many of you would describe yourself as feminists. Um, in some quarters, that's a dirty word. And when I asked the last class, which is the last class, by the way, um, <coughs> is mostly women, the, the 8 o'clock session. And I asked them, so you know, what does feminism mean to you? And you get about five different answers because it's changed its meaning over, over time. Um, if you had to boil it down to the common thing that they, they all share, I suppose it would be that they, they all say that you know, what's been left out of the picture all too often women's experiences and concerns. And this was going on in moral theory. Um, you know, who, who actually wrote a lot of the moral theory that we've been reading up to this point? Men or women? Men, right. And why was that? Was it that women, um, their books weren't good enough? Okay, it was normal. In, in what sense? What does that mean? They had more opportunities to do so too, right? I mean, the educational institutions were, one second, were, were dominated by men. Um, politics was dominated by men. Still is to some extent. Um, the economy, male dominated. So a lot of these thinkers, you know, some of these thinkers too, by the way, are coming out of situations where women are radically excluded from the kind of life that they're living. Aristotle, for example. Um, writing in ancient Athens, Plato too. In ancient Athens, except for you know women working in the marketplace and prostitutes um, and, and a few slaves, women were in the house, and that was it. It was very um, strictly separate. So you know Socrates is unusual in that he he talks about having learned from women, um, and that was a product of their culture. Did it have to be that way? No. So, you know, Aristotle says a lot of things that now, nowadays we look at and say, wow, that's really crazy to say that about women. Um, but if you look at his culture, I think it helps you to understand that. Does that make it okay? You know, can you say, well, you know, he just didn't know any better. A lot of things that matter to women, and probably should matter to men too, get left out of the picture as a result. 
And this took place throughout the history of moral theory. What were you going to do? Yeah, I was going to say more or less what you said, but because um, like back in the days, women, they didn't have rights like, to, go to, to get like, educated and go to school. So the ones who were actually educated were men. So. Yeah, you know, if you look at the history of philosophy, for example, there are some women philosophers in, in ancient times, um, but they were the exceptions. And uh, for instance, the, the Cynic School, there was a guy, Crates, and um, he was one of the Cynic teachers, and his wife was a Cynic too. And, I, and, I, and it's really bad, I'm blanking on her name. The reason why she was a philosopher is because her father made a deliberate effort to bring her up different than the other women as a philosopher. It was understood that you know, philosophy is a male concern. Uh, so these two married and, and uh, lived as, as cynics, which basically meant you know, living very Spartan lifestyles. Um, Rene Descartes, you may remember from your intro class, um, one of the people who spurred, well, there were two women who were very important in, in spurring his thought. One gave him a job, uh, Queen Christina of Sweden. She brought him up to Sweden, which at that time was like a superpower to uh, be one of the court philosophers. But he also um, had a correspondence with a princess, Princess Elizabeth, and that led Descartes to write one of the few pieces of arguably ethics that he did, the uh, Treatise on the Passions of the Soul. And the reason why he did it is, is she spurred his thinking. But do we know much about her other than that? Not really, because, you know, again, it was normal not to care too much about women's contributions. Uh, and there have been some really important women philosophers in the 20th century. Um, Simone Weil, Hannah Arendt, um, Iris Murdoch. Uh, these are all people before the feminist revolution is really getting underway in the 60s and 70s. They're making contributions. A lot of stuff got left out or downplayed as a result of um, not even women involved with the processes of moral philosophy. And if you want to think about the ethics of care, it has to do with, with these sorts of things. Um, now we've, we've talked about some of these in this class, haven't we? Like relationships. Every time that I ask you, what are the most important things to you? What are the things you find make your life valuable? What are the, the things you're worried about losing? What are your goods? You guys bring up relationships. You bring up family and friends, right? Um, sometimes you talk about the workplace, mentors, or things like that. A lot of moral theories don't recognize relationships, individual relationships, as, as important goods that are not just reducible to the people involved. Um, the ethics of care stresses relationships, stresses the importance of them. Um, so if you have to choose between two courses of action, one of which is going to promote or support or, or continue relationships and the other one is going to break them down and other things are equal, you should choose the one that supports relationships. Maybe even if it's, if it's between pleasure, what would be more pleasant for you and maintaining a relationship, the ethics of care would say maintain the relationship. Are your friends always pleasant to be with? What about your family? I mean, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family, right? Um, but should you should you keep those relationships up? It may not even occur to you to say, oh, "Screw them! I'm not going to have anything to do with them." But, but people do that, don't they? Um, that's a that's a choice that you make, whether you realize it or not, to continue a relationship, to foster it, to see it as, as valuable. Um, what about when a relationship relationship gets screwed up? Do you just cut and run, or do you say, ah, we got to fix this? The ethics of care would say it's very important to fix broken relationships. That's a good. That might be more valuable than money, prestige, pleasure, um, even getting to do your own thing. Success. Relationships are more important than that. <coughs> Another thing that ethics of care stressed was emotions. And we've talked a little bit about emotions over the course of the semester. We're going to talk about them more when we get to Aristotle. Um, traditionally, if you think about traditional gender roles, um, who's more emotional, you know, with traditional gender roles, men or women? 
Why? Is there any reason for that? I mean, first of all, do you think it's actually true? That women are, you know, somehow fundamentally more emotional than, than men are? Yeah. I think women are more willing or like not afraid to like, show it compared to the men. I think you're right about that. Yeah. Also, we portray different kinds of emotions. That's what I think people forget. They're all emotions. Yeah. It's just what type of emotions are you portraying? Because when we think emotional, we're thinking sensitive, but there's different kinds of emotions. Yeah, if you had to pick one emotion that men are allowed to express generally, not, not just necessarily in our society, but you know, like throughout history, what, what would it be? Anger. Anger. Yeah, very, very good. Um, and you know, battlefield, that's a good place to show anger. In the marketplace, you know, fight with other people and compete. You're right, that's an emotion. Um, but, you know, men and women feel the, the entire range of, of uh, other emotions, you know, ranging from fairly neutral ones like surprise to very negative ones like uh, disgust, hatred, um, you know, certain forms of sadness to very positive ones like joy, love, sympathy. But you're right, in, in, in a lot of societies, um, the way that we understand gender makes it easier, it gives women permission, you might say, to express things that, that men can't. But also women sometimes aren't allowed to express other things that men can't, right? Do, do, are men and women who are angry perceived the same way? There, there are certain inhibitions on expressing anger that, that women experience, certain pressures, right? If a woman is angry, she's seen as, as somehow more dangerous than a man who's angry. It's pretty unlikely, right? I mean, who's, who occupies the, the prisons for the most part for violent crimes? A lot of women in prison? I mean, most states will actually have a place that's called the woman's prison. Because that they don't they don't need a whole bunch of them, you know. Um, but they'll have, you know, this male prison, this male prison, this male prison. Um, yeah, so emotions, um, traditionally, um, the way in which we feel and express and value emotions has been very much dependent on, on gender. And emotions have been, for, uh, for a large part, pushed out of philosophy and pushed out of, out of ethics. The idea is, if you want to figure out what you ought to do, you want to put your emotions aside, put your feelings aside. Um, the fact that you love somebody else might lead you to be, you know, less, less than impartial. It might lead you to favor them. And that would be a bad thing, wouldn't it? At least if you're a utilitarian or a conscious. Now, would that necessarily be a bad thing from other ethical perspectives? Um, can you think of any ethics other than the ethics of care that say it's important to have certain feelings towards other people? I think about certain moral codes or certain moral ideals. Maybe not a whole theory, but think of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, in, in, in uh, Matthew, um, this Jesus guy's walking around. And he's saying things like, "Love your enemies." Um, love is an emotion, <clears throat> and, and you can always say, "Well, you know, we don't mean the emotion by love." But that's not actually what it's saying, because it also says if you're angry with your brother, uh, you'll be liable to the judgment, and, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, and all this other stuff that has to do with kind of affective or emotional stances. Virtue ethics also thinks that, that your emotions really matter. It's, it's not whether you feel them or not. It's do you feel them in the right way at the right time? Do you act on them the right way? But our emotions are, can be a guide for our behavior. A lot of moral theories excluded that. Um, the ethics of care says we should actually rely on our emotions, provided not, not just every emotion. So if I hate people, that doesn't mean I get to do anything I like, right? Um, because maybe I don't have good reason to hate people. But our emotions are often a good guide for how we ought to behave. And certain emotions really ought to be cultivated as goods. Um, you know, what, what do you see as positive emotions? In your own life, what do you want other people to feel towards you? 
anger? No. What do you want people to feel towards you? Yeah. Like respect. Yeah. Uh, a sense of maybe even admiration if you accomplish great things. Certainly respect. Treating you as a person. What else? Respect is nice, but it's. I mean, love, even though it's yeah. in each relationship. I mean, we all want to be loved. We all, uh, not even necessarily, you know, love with the big Valentine's Day heart <coughs> stuff, but we all want to be, we all want people to feel <coughs> good towards us, affectionate towards us, to like us. Um, there is a deep seated need within all of us, even the heart, most hardened person, to actually be loved by somebody. I'll tell you something that's kind of interesting. It doesn't have to do with this, but I think it's good, good at that. When I was teaching in the, the prison, in the Indiana State Prison, there were all these cats all over the place. And the reason that those cats were there were prisoners adopted them. And these cats would be euthanized otherwise. It was a humane society thing. So it's good for the, good for the cats. They don't get killed. Uh, it's good for the guys. Um, because the guys now have a pet, and it's good for the prison overall because it gives something they can take away from the guys that they really care about. Uh, so it helps keep them in line. If they screw up, their cat gets taken away, and that's like the end of the world for some of these guys. And if they work a prison job, they'll make up to like 35 cents an hour. And um, some of the guys who would have a prison job would work 40 hours a week to pay for the cat food and the cat litter. What I was really struck by was how loving a lot of these guys were in describing their cats or towards their own cats or towards other people's cats. So you'd see these hardened guys who, you know, a lot of them work out all the time, so huge guys, tattoos, you know, all over their bodies, you know, all sorts of weird, you know, facial hair, one form or another, because they all want to make a, you know, a statement in prison khakis. Um, picking up a cat and, and petting it and talking nice to it. Which looks kind of incongruous, doesn't it? Um, and you'd be, you know, you'd be tempted to say, oh, these guys are just marshmallows. Well, they're not. I mean, because if you, if you take them out of that context, they're, they're you know, dangerous guys. And, and they'll, they'll fight with each other and the guards and all that. Um, but for a lot of these guys, what's really great about these cats, it's the first thing that they're able to love um, and take care of them, and to have them love them back. And that experience of it helps to change them over time. It's sort of like an apprenticeship in becoming more and more humane, so to speak. Um, not every moral theory could see that as, as important, right? The ethics of care would see that as something absolutely central. We should, if you're following the ethics of care, we should have those kind of policies in place to try to change people for the better, to let them experience these positive emotions, to form attachments, to develop a sense of responsibility for another being. Um, another thing that's, that's germane to the ethics of care, very often when we think about moral theory, you guys may have experienced this in this class, it's almost like you have to take yourself out of the picture and take other real people out of the picture. When we think about Kant and utilitarianism, does that sound about right? Mm -hmm. That's not the case for everything, right? Remember we talked about Ross, and Ross said, hey, real relationships matter, real context. Um, he wasn't big on emotions, but he did say, <coughs> you know, we, we have these duties that we, we sense in real context, in real situations. And the ethics of care says that um, what matters more is persons than principles. And again, this isn't completely unique. There's a type of philosophy called personalism, which actually stresses this as well. If you want to be a feminist, to, to be a personalist. But historically, what it took to bring these issues to the fore <clears throat> was the feminist revolution and this attention to you know, bringing women's voices back into, uh, or not back into, because they were kind of never really there to begin with, into philosophy and to stress the importance of these things. Could, could you know, could this have all been realized without that? Probably, but it didn't happen that way. 
the way that it happened was it took women saying, hey, this stuff matters. Pay attention to it. You know, knock off the stuff that's keeping you from paying attention to it for it to actually change. And, and that's why we have the ethics of care. Um, now, the, this piece by, by Tong, part of what she's doing is, is explaining the ethics of care, which is coming in part of Carol Gilligan's work. And then she's looking at some criticism. So that's what we're going to do today. And you can think to yourself, are these good criticisms, are these bad criticisms? So first, let, let's get kind of a handle on, on why um, Gilligan came up with this, this ethics of care. And there's, there's two main things that, that Tong talks about. One of them has to do with uh, moral development. Are any of you familiar with this Kohlberg scale of moral development? Maybe you had it in <coughs> class or sociology class or you saw it somewhere else. Does this ring a bell for any of you? This guy Kohlberg, who actually, his work came out of work in prisons, by the way. Um, he came up with this scale, the levels, you know, one through six of moral development. At the very low level, you're concerned mainly just with, you know, an ego perspective, uh, punishment, reward, that's, that's it, that's all you care about. Think about infants, right? Infants are not particularly moral beings, for the most part. Uh, Two-year-old children, how many of you ever babysat? What are two-year-olds like? Yeah. Insane. <laughs> They're very selfish, aren't they? I mean, they can do unselfish things, but they also have this attitude, what's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine. And if you don't like it, I'm going to yell and, and kick and, and scream. And how do you get them to behave? You have to reward them and punish them, because that's about all they know. And then after a while, they start to, you know, get to higher levels. They start to... You know, they get to the point where they care about what other people think and feel. So they want to be a good boy or a good girl because they want other people's affection. That's better than just, you know, I'm going to punish you or reward you. And you're not going to like the pain that I give you if you do the wrong thing. That's, that's a higher level to be motivated by, I want other people to like me. I want to be able to be in a relationship with them. Um, and then we can get higher and higher and start recognizing each other's rights. You know, we can start saying, um, I'm going to treat you like this because I want you to treat me this way. And eventually we can get to the point where we recognize abstract principles. Um, we go through a social contract stage as well for Colburn, but eventually we get to the point where we're all conscious, uh, basically. So Gilligan was a student of Colbert's, and she was looking at men and women and the way that they carry out moral reasoning. That's how Kohlberg measures this. He, he gives people tests and he says, here's a moral dilemma for you. How would you solve this moral dilemma and why would you do it this way? Sort of like what I do with you in the application assignments, right? And in the application assignments, it's not just finding the, you know, what should you do? It's also being able to explain, well, from this perspective, we would do this. Here's why this is the case. So they do these tests. And then they locate people at these different levels. Um, and they look at the way in which they carry out moral reasoning. So, you know, if the person is saying, well, this person should do this just so they don't get in trouble, they're probably at a low level. If they say, you know, it's not right that they do this because what if everyone else acted that way? They're, they're at a higher level. Um, what Gilligan observed is that men and women don't always approach these things the same way at least in Western society. Women much more often would frame things in terms of relationships, frame, you know, framing uh, pres preservation of the relationship or that the relationship involves certain duties or, or you know, uh, responsibilities towards each other. They would bring up how people would feel. So doing something might, doing something bad might be wrong, not just because it harms another person or you know, it damages their interests, but because it makes them feel bad. And they were much more interested in talking about the real people involved than in just using abstract principles. Now the problem is, from a Kohlberg scale perspective, that would place women about midway. So that would mean that women at least the women who are, you know, falling into this sort of typical pattern would be less morally developed than men who are reasoning in a social contract or a conscient way. Um, 
And Gilligan noted that, at least in our society, if you ask about moral matters, quite often men frame things in terms of what she calls the justice perspective. They talk in terms of rights, of you know, competition, of coming to agreements with each other, um, fairness, that sort of thing. Women quite often talk in terms of a care perspective, relationships, emotions, caring for other people, taking care of them. So does that mean that, that men can, you know, reach a higher level because of their perspective than, than women can? If that's the case, then um, women would be condemned to always be sort of lesser moral agents. And so what, what Gilligan was saying is this Kohlberg level is not really measuring human moral development. It's measuring typically male moral development. So we need another scale for measuring women's development or typically female development, because some men can, can, can have a more typically female attitude towards these, and some women can have a more typically male attitude. Right? There's some women who, <coughs> they don't care about anybody else, and they're, they're gonna protect their rights and you know, uh, achieve their interests and screw everybody else up, right? There's something like that. And there's some men who are you know, very interested in relationships and caring and that sort of stuff too. So what would another scale look like? Well, Gilligan talks in terms of stages as well. And so the first stage is to be self-centered. Uh, to frame things in terms of oneself and one's needs and, and wants. The second stage for women, or for this typically female way of, of looking at things, is to think about other people and their wants, their needs, their desires, their interests, but at the exclusion of, this, of one's own. And now, now think about that for a moment. Is, is that a sort of typical uh, or stereotypical female way of relating to other people? To put their own needs ahead of one's own and to sacrifice themselves? What do you think? Think about how many moms have like worked and worked and worked almost thanklessly. Uh, so their kids could enjoy these much better opportunities. You know, it's not to say dads don't do that too, right? There's plenty of dads out there working two, three jobs. Uh, do women in general get a lot of uh, recognition or, or respect, is the word that you used, or some sort of reciprocity for doing the nurturing, the caring, the taking care of people, or is a lot of it kind of uncompensated? If, if, bless you. If you're willing to care for other people, can you find yourself very easily caught in a situation, whether you're a man or a woman, where the other person's needs come to predominate and yours kind of get lost in the process? Yeah. I think it happens all the time with women. They, sometimes they feel they have, sometimes they feel and sometimes they actually do have to kind of make decisions between having a kid and starting a family and maybe taking a better job. Yeah. Like moving up the ladder. Um, I think that's a prime example of like how they, they choose the relationship that they want to, want to have with their child over something that maybe would benefit them more than it would benefit the child. Yeah. And, and I think probably still today, there's, there's a higher proportion of men who will choose the job over their relationship with the child than, than women. Um, in the past, and this still goes on today, there, there have been a lot of relationships where the woman was seen as just there to take care of the man, to attend to his needs, um, support him. He would go out and be the bread earner, and she's sort of the, you know, the, 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 Behind every successful man, there's a, uh, a good woman sort of thing. You've all heard that expression. Um, well, that, if she's behind, her needs aren't going to be taken care of. She's going to end up subordinating her own desires, wishes, aspirations to taking care of this guy. He might be a schmuck, you know, uh, but he's, you know, he's the guy, yeah. I mean, based on what you're saying and what was uh, said earlier, like how a lot of mothers, like, they take different jobs so they can take care of their kids or even wind up staying at home. Yeah. I think even to this day, like, mothers, like, 
they'll, they'll potentially may have a nine to five job, but when they come home, they're still stuck doing like the house chores. Yeah, most of them. And you don't, most of us don't really value that. Like the only time I, I personally realize is every now and then when like, you know, my parents go on a vacation and I'm stuck doing everything in the house. I'm like, wow, mom, I'm like, you do a lot. And that's when I realize it. And then I forget about it all over again, you know. You can probably, some of you can probably relate to that, I think. Yeah. I think it's like different with every like situation. Like I think women are expected to like do those type of things. Yeah. And, like I get what you say that sometimes people don't realize how much they do. But I mean, in my case, like I do realize how much my mom does. I don't think it's about like not acknowledging it. I think that it's like sometimes we don't realize that they have needs as much as the same ones we do. Yeah. And we don't give to them how they give to us. I think you're right. Um, and it is different. You, you talk about it being different in different situations. It's different between the generations, too. Things are a bit more equal for your generation and for my generation than they were for my parents or your grandparents' generation. And I also think it has to do with like how your parents were brought up. Like, yes, My very roommate, much. my like, one of the girls who lives in my house, our moms are just totally different. And my mom does like a lot for me. Yeah. And she's like really involved in my life. And her mom was just not involved in her life. She did everything on her own. And like, they just weren't close. And I always found it so odd. But then once I like kind of knew how her mom grew up, I kind of got it. Cause I mean, I guess she didn't have very nurturing parents. Yeah. So, but I guess that too could go both ways. Like, you could have parents who aren't nurturing, and then you could become like a really nurturing parent, or you could have parents who didn't really nurture you, and you could be the same to your kid because I guess you yeah. think you got through it fine. You see it as the norm. Yeah. Um, I think you're right, and, and we'll come back to this, this this stage thing in just a second. But that brings up a good point. We are a product of our relationships. Who we are as as individual persons is not some abstract. You know, individual who was was there before anything else ever began. Like McIntyre said at the beginning of the semester, we're caught up in our own stories, and our stories are in large part who else is in our stories. If you had a nurturing set of parents, that's part of your story, and that allows you different ways to, to move in your story than, than somebody who whose parents would say complete, you know, cold, unfeeling jerks, right? Um, um. I just, I, I actually grew up, like, my dad was born in 1941, so he, wow. he, yeah. Your dad is, your dad is older than my, my parents. Probably, yeah. But, um, he always, like, if I ever did something, like, cleaned, or, yeah. like, I had, I was a pet, he'd be like, oh, you're going to be such a good wife. And <laughs> I'm not kidding. And he, that's how he thinks, so, and my mom is, a, like, a successful lawyer, yeah. and he is always yelling at her about how she is never home, and, like, because, like, I, I don't know, but anyway, but I think that mothers have that role, and they fall into that role, only because I think it's nature, I think that that reaction is natural, because some, the baby's, like, completely defenseless and independent, yeah. and you, somebody has to be responsible for, like, nurturing it and making sure it survives. So I just think that, that yeah. that's normal. And that's something that the ethics of care talks about as well. Is, is, um, it places a premium on care. And care for who? For those who are particularly <coughs> vulnerable. You know, children are, are among them, especially infants. I mean, if a baby doesn't just receive food, um, they, they did these experiments. They didn't mean to do these experiments back in the 1950s. They were, everyone was very germ conscious back then. So they took these, these children in, in um, what do you call them, orphanages. And they didn't pick them up much. And they didn't handle them very much. A lot of the babies died. And they were being fed enough and they were being you know, changed and all the other stuff. They weren't sick. They just didn't thrive. As it turns out, in order to develop properly, babies actually need to be touched, need affection, they need shared gaze in order for their brains to develop, right? They need to be talked to, all these Is that shared? Sort of, they need shared gaze? I've never heard of They do need that. shared gaze, yeah. That, that's part of the, the process of development. A child who doesn't have these things, if they survive, is going to have attachment uh, problems, which will really screw them up for other things. I was talking to my friends last night, and we were talking about how, like, my friend's, like, little niece is, like, two and a half, and like, he's an iPad, and, like, opens up an iPhone lock and all that stuff. And what she was saying about like, Yeah, my kids can do that too. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's crazy. And like what she was saying about having like an older dad, like my dad's old, pretty old, well, I don't know. I guess compared to some people's dad, my dad's like 67 like, or something. And so I think it's interesting because he's very like strict and like old school and my mom's 10 years younger than him and she's totally different. They're just complete opposites. And I think it's Yeah, there are be, generational differences. Yeah, I think like the gener generational differences, like I think it's gonna be crazy to see how our kids like we, I feel like our brains are already so fried from the excessive amount of technology we have. Like all like I know I have like sleeping problems because I can't go to bed because my mind is like yeah. wired all the time. And like I feel like it's can't be healthy for like babies to be using iPads at like age two. Like there, I think it's like, so interesting that, yeah. to see what they're like in like ten years from that. Like they're starting using such advanced technology when they're like there was actually a proposal in the Chronicle of Higher Education um, just this week that says that your generation um, needs to be taught how to pay attention to things because of the technology. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I, I'm not quite sure that I buy that we have to start thinking in terms of attention literacy skills or something like that. But yeah, you're right, the technology that modifies our, our living environment. I don't, I don't think ethics of care talks much about that. Per se, but that, that's important. We can we can talk more about that when we get to the virtue ethics stuff because it has to do with habituation. Well, let me come back to this. So we, we talked about a stage where the person is the, the person is self-centered, and then they become very other-centered at the expense of the self, and that's an advance. That, that's better than just being self-centered. But the best stage is to be at the place where one can reconcile one's own needs, wants, aspirations with taking care of other people's wants, needs, aspirations, recognizing them, and find some sort of equilibrium. So that's what um, Gilligan says female moral development looks like. Instead of just, you know, going away from sort of an egoist perspective to a universal, um, more or less conscient perspective, it goes from a self to other to self and other in relationship perspective. Um, could you bring the two of them together? Probably. There's another thing I want to talk about as well that Gilligan um, brought up. She talked, she uses Freudian um, psychoanalytic, what's called object relation theory. And um, you've probably all heard of the Oedipus complex. Yeah? And what she's interested in is not that, you know, the, the the uh, male child wants to kill the dad and, and, and marry the mom or any of that sort of stuff. Because that's actually not what Freud is saying anyway. Um, what, he, what he is saying, what she's getting from that, is that in order to um, become a self, to have an identity, male children end up dissociating from the mother, who is the source of affection and, and nurturing and all that and identifying with the father who's usually out there traditionally in the workplace you know has more prestige but is also in some ways more out of touch with his his emotional side and so in order to become a man that means you have to separate from the emotional and become much more rational competitive interested in, in fairness rules that sort of stuff um, what happens for for girls in their development they they, you know, um, desire what the father has to offer as sort of a symbol. But they don't disassociate from the mother. They identify with the mother uh, until they're forced out of that, you might say. And somebody comes along and says, hey, you're here. You know, you got to break these associations with your, your girlhood friends. You're too close to them. This is holding you back, that sort of thing. And they experience that as a loss. And... What she talks about women having trouble with is developing a sense of self apart from other people and the relationships that they're in. So the, the danger for women is um, finding another person, you know, say a romantic relationship with a man, and seeing themselves as the caretaker and the support system of that man, and not as being an independent person. The problem that, that boys and that men end up having, given this theory, is with developing the possibility of intimacy, that closeness, that being in touch with one's emotional side, and being able to share that with other people. 
So both sexes end up becoming stunted uh, because of this. So an ethics of care would be trying to, would be advocating things that would bridge that gap. And so if it's a moral theory, moral theory should tell us how we ought to act, what kind of people we ought to be, how to decide difficult cases. Um, this moral theory would be saying these are the things that really count. When, when you're trying to figure out what the right thing to do is, figure out what would actually nurture other people, what would sustain relationships, what would allow um, people's emotions to, to play a role. Um, now there's some criticisms of the ethics of care, and we're not going to hit on all of these. Um, but let's look at a few of these. What she's contrasting to the, the care perspective is what she calls the justice perspective. So we've looked at some justice perspective moral theories, you know, utilitarianism, communism. There are certain things that are right, certain things that are wrong, um, certain things that are fair, certain things that are unfair. We can come up with rules for things rather than just focusing on um, relationships that may not actually have rules governing them so much as, you know, a sense of who the other person is and what their needs are. Um, do justice and care intersect, or are they totally separate from each other? It sounds, when you read Gilligan or you read some of these other ethics of care people, like you've got you know, care over here and justice over here, and they've got nothing to do with each other. But could that really be the case? Um, maybe they're actually you know, more like they interpenetrate each other. So in order to, be, in order to actually do justice to justice, to you know, make kind of a pun, you would have to be caring. Or in order to be adequately caring, you would actually have to worry to some extent about fairness or justice. Um, so some examples that Tong uses are things like this. If, if you have a personal relationship with another person, some of you may have been in this already, and you become the, the caregiver, the person who's always giving to the other person, taking care of them, concerned with them, um, and they're primarily just the recipient, Let's say it's adults. Let's not say it's kids. So I forget, you know, younger brothers, sisters, babysitting, that sort of thing. Adult relationships, maybe with a friend or a boyfriend or girlfriend, or even a parent who's particularly needy. Um, if you're constantly giving, bless you, and you're not giving, you're, you're not getting in return, so your needs aren't being recognized and attended and, and cared for. Is that fair? Or is that certainly unjust? Is it exploitative, do you think? I would say it's kind of unjust, pretty much. To, yeah. to, to just be on the receiving end. Yeah, unless there's some sort of reciprocity. It doesn't mean that you have to get exactly the same thing that you get from the other person. Unless there's some sort of reciprocity, it seems like there's, there's a lack of justice in the even if it's a caring relationship. Yeah, I, mean, I think you get, when you're taking care of somebody, you, you get something out of it. And then some people just make a living. That's their job, and they get compensation that way. Yeah. And I think that's the <clears throat> um, I, I don't know. I think, I think that if you put into it, I think you can, there's a lot of times there's one-way relationships. And yeah. if you're... If you're somebody that understands that, Bless you. somebody that understands that, and you get back, and, and if you just see it for what it is, yeah, I think I don't know if fair matters. If it, if it being fair matters, so if, if you know it's the right thing, then I think that that the fact that it's you're doing the right thing kind of trumps the fact that you're not getting something back. And there will be some relationships that are necessarily more one way. Like, you know, when you have kids, you're going to find out that you're going to, if you're a good parent, you're going to give your kids way more than you're going to get back from your kids. But hopefully your kids are going to give to other people, right? Um, taking care of the terminally ill people or people in, in retirement homes or things like that, I, I guess would be along those lines as well. Those who are uh, infirm, sick, aged. Yeah. So the, their fairness wouldn't enter into it, you're right. Um, but if you have adult relationships, like two friends, I mean, you can see cases like this where 
one friend is constantly supporting the other friend and they're not getting anything in return. Okay? That seems unfair, doesn't it? You look at it from the outside. So the fairness and justice, the fairness or justice perspective and the care perspective would fit together in that way. Uh, personal relationships also involve becoming vulnerable to each other, don't they? If you, I mean, think about the damage that you could do to your friends compared to people that don't really know them. Do you know stuff about your friends? Weak spots, buttons to push, <coughs> if you wanted to hurt them, you could. If you were a bad person, could you could you ex easily exploit some of your friends? Probably. Um, you might even exploit some of the things that are best in them. You know, a, a good sense of, of shame in doing the wrong things. They did something wrong, you know about it, you blackmail them, now you can get them to do even worse wrong things. You know? Well, that's that's a vulnerability. And that would to do that would be to be unjust, wouldn't it? Think back to Plato and some of the other things. Uh, the kind of person who would do that, are they usually happy people? Is their soul usually in good alignment? There's usually something uh, dark, something, something you know, uh, corrupt within, within their, their soul. Um, what about when we screw things up? You know, if we're in relationships with other people and we do care about them, um, are we always caring? Have we ever hurt their feelings? I'm bad with that. I forget birthdays. You know, thank God for Facebook, because otherwise I'd, I'd forget everyone's birthday. Um, and uh, are we always properly grateful? Do we say things that we didn't realize were going to hurt the other person? What's our responsibility, though? To make up for it, basically. Yeah, and that's that's a matter of justice rather than just a matter of caring. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see them as two sides of the same coin. Yeah, there's sometimes that, I mean, we, you talked about like in life, like sending thank you cards. Yeah. And that's a sense of like that's the right thing to do. And yeah. I agree, and I totally agree with like that. I agree with remembering people's birthdays. That's just like you need to do that. But then there's sometimes when people are like. Instead of, I think there needs to be like a want. Instead of just, I need to call my friend yeah. because I haven't called them. I need to just to maintain. I don't. I, sometimes I think it's just, better if you actually desire to. Yeah, to desi a genuine desire to continue a relationship as opposed to I need this person. Because then you're seeing them as a, as as a tool. You're like they're they're useful in a way. I don't know if that's looking yeah. at them as an object that we're talking about treating real persons over abstract principles. I think you're right. If you're saying, I need to talk to this person so that I can maintain this relationship so I can get something out of it. Imagine you were to say that to the person when you call. Yeah. I know we haven't talked for a while, but I just wanted to keep the lines of communication open because I never know when I'm going to need something from you. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, as opposed that, to, I missed you. I, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. Yeah. It makes a very different impression. <laughs> you listen to the way people talk about people say, oh, I need to call that person. Instead of, I want to call that person. You're right. Yeah, our language often gives away our, our moral makeup. Well, there's also like times like I, like you're not good with birthdays and stuff like that. Neither mm -hmm. am I. Like usually half the time my mother's reminding me, and I don't really feel like calling people. But yeah. it's not because I don't care about them. It's just I don't consider that as valuable as somebody else may do so. So I'm doing it because I know they'll feel good that I did it for them, but not because I actually wanted to really go yeah. ahead and do it. You know, my big problem is actually is, and some, I bet you some of you fall into this too, you don't call somebody or write to them for a while, and then you, you feel like you ought to, right? And um, you feel like, well, i got to really put aside some time so I can write a really good letter to this person, because it's been such a long time, um, or i got to wait till the right moment to call them, and then does it come along? No, another week goes by, and now you're, you're feeling a bit more guilty, and now you're thinking, I really got to talk to this person now. And, and it just keeps on piling up and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually you never actually call them or talk to them, do you? Yeah. I feel like a lot of times, too, it's like, well, you haven't called me in two months, or you haven't called me in two weeks, yeah. so why should I call you? Like, or when you like, 
do like try to like keep a relationship. Yeah. Be like, oh, I haven't talked to them enough. Keep doing, like, keep trying, and they don't ever do it back. And yeah. Like, well, that's that reciprocity. I feel like that happens so much when you go to college. Like, all your friends go away, and you're so busy. Yeah. Like my one friend, she goes to Georgetown, and all my friends, we just never hear from her. And like, what well, we all would like try, like, okay, like I should call her, I should call her, and like we would, and then she would never do it back. And then we just like only see her here. Yeah, that, that's a lack of um, reciprocity. Now going back to what Danny said, I think there's a difference between, like, there's definitely a difference between wanting to call someone and needing to call somebody. But then there's a big difference of I should call, you know. Where should is kind of just like, all right, well, I need to do it just so they know like, that I'm making Moral it. Moral obligation. Stuff. Yeah. Where, so, so where saying, want and need are kind of more of the doing it because you want to talk to them, I guess. Okay, so we could say that there's like three different modes there. There's the moral should, because it'd be good for them, or you're benefiting them in some way. Then there's the need, because they may benefit you in some way. And then there's the want, because you actually it's the genuine enjoy it. That's an interesting uh, set of distinctions. Um, you guys are, are in effect carrying out what um, they call philosophical analysis right, right here, which is good. Um, let me go on with, with, with some of these uh, other uh, aspects of the criticisms. Um, so justice and care intersecting. Um, what about when you've got relationships? And it's not just you and one other person, but there's like a network of, of relationships then fairness can come into it, right? Imagine you're a parent and you've got three children. One of your children is really, really talented and that talent probably requires some, some nurturing and some you know, scheduling things around to cultivate it. Like let's say the child is a really talented uh, violinist. You know, they started out with a Suzuki method when they were four and all that other stuff, right? Um, now your other kids aren't quite so talented. Maybe they do have talents, but you haven't figured out what they are yet, and those other kids don't, don't know it either. Do you give more time to the talented kid than to the other kids? That's a question of fairness, right? That's, I mean, if you're caring, you say, well, you care about all your kids equally, but that doesn't tell you exactly how that care should be expressed. Maybe justice or some sense of fairness has to come in in how you distribute those things. I know this is kind of a different situation, but my grandmother on my dad's side had five kids, and my dad's uh, twin, I forget what the disease is called, but it's where like your, oh, your head grows Oh, those are good examples too, yeah. My, um, where one kid has special needs. Yeah, and then yeah. My, my aunt, who's also not with us now, had uh, the this, this spinal condition, I forget what it's called, and she was in a wheelchair for most of her life, so yeah. that, like that's kind of the same thing where you kind of have to put your other kid or kids, not in the background, but you kind of have to tend to the kids with the needs a little more. I know it's a different situation because you have to because it's their health. But yeah, well, I think it's, it, it's, it's a similar situation that involves distribution of uh, time, tension, care, that sort of stuff. But it, it's, it is different in that it's uh, coming from a different reason, yeah. from somebody being caught in, in, you know, more more vulnerability rather than a matter of promotion of someone yeah. else's yeah. talents. Um, let me go on to the, to the next criticism. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. But what, another criticism is you can say, okay, there's these two perspectives, care and justice, but maybe care is not as good of a moral perspective as justice. Uh, and here's why they say that. Um, some philosophers are, are perfectly willing to regard care as being sort of typically feminine, and they say it may have something to do with morality, but they say it's less central to morality than, than justice is, um, or that it might actually <clears throat> go against morality. And here's how. The ethics of care says you should be a certain kind of person. You should be a, a person who cares. That, that's what it is to be a good person. Uh, a caring person tries to foster or you know, nurture, or if they're, if they're bad, to steer bad relationships into good relationships. They respect other people's emotions. They take emotions into account. Um, what if you're not that kind of person? Well, then from an ethics of care perspective, you would not be as good of a person as somebody who is caring. Now, that makes it sound like in order to be a good moral person, you have to have certain, not just moral traits, but certain psychological traits. 
What were you going to say? Um, I just have a question about um, the relationship mm -hmm. aspect. If you have a friend and like the, your friends and yeah. but you just feel like it's like a poisonous relationship, what are you uh, supposed to do? Yeah, that's that's a good question. For the care perspective, that's one of the criticisms that's made of it a little bit later on. And they, they say um, if caring is such an important thing and you're supposed to foster relationships, what about relationships that are exploitative or destructive or even just are holding you back from, from developing? Um, the ethics of care perspective would say, well, that's not a good relationship, though. And, and you don't try to maintain that. As a matter of fact, um, relationships, sort of like traditional male-female relationships, where the man is, is you know, the rule giver, the one who's in charge, the one who has all the power, and the woman is just there to, to support and, and you know, be kind of like a, a yes woman, you know. Um, that would be a, a bad relationship, and the ethics of care wouldn't say that's a good thing to continue that. Um, it's hard to draw the line from the perspective of the ethics of care, though. Again, I think that's where justice might be. But let me go back to, to this, this, this other, and we'll come, we'll come back to that criticism. So, the ethics of care seems to require people to be of a certain sort, of a certain psychological makeup, to be a caring person. Now, let's assume for the moment that there is a sort of typical male attitude towards the world and a typical female attitude towards the world. If the ethics of care is, is the moral theory we ought to use, that means men are at a disadvantage, right? because they're less caring, they're more competitive. Would a moral theory that like automatically puts one whole group at a disadvantage be a good moral theory then? That's, that's a possible criticism of this. Um, I'm not sure that, that I buy that criticism though. Go ahead. If, uh, putting someone at an advantage of making ethical decisions doesn't seem like an argument. It's like, we'll just, decide to be an ethics of care like philosopher as a person yeah. and you just work at it and you get better at it. I, I, like, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I mean, if, a, let's, let's compare this to utilitarian perspective, right? If, it would be almost as if you were to say, well, you know, utilitarian, utilitarianism says that you're not supposed to make yourself central and, and you know, your pleasure outweigh everybody else's pleasure. But I happen to be that kind of person. Yeah. There's something wrong with utilitarianism. Well, no, that, that means that there's something wrong with me from the perspective of utilitarianism. And if I accept that as a moral theory, then that means I need to learn how to be less self-centered and to care more about the rest of you and your pleasures and pains, right? Um, so there, that, you're right, that's, that's the problem with that sort of criticism. Um, now to go back to the, the issue of exploitation or um, toxic, Brought toxic relationships. One of the problems with the ethics of care is, is it doesn't seem all that well equipped to deal with this. Or think about bullying, for example, which, which occurs in friendships sometimes. Um, we brought up this term frenemy before, right? Um, the ethics of care wouldn't say that's a good relationship. But how do you draw the lines using that to say that um, that relationship should be ended or, or should be modified? The only way you could do that is by sort of taking um, models of, of good relationships and saying it should be more like this or more like that. Um, then it starts to sound a little bit like um, virtue ethics, though, doesn't it? So we're going to see some, some similarities between this and, and virtue ethics if we're looking at models. The last thing um, that I want to hit on as far as um, criticism. The ethics of care, because it is, so the ethics of care distinguishes between a male attitude towards things, a justice perspective, and a female attitude to care perspective, right? And it says that, that traditionally, historically, men have been over here, and women have been over here, um, and everybody should be like this. Now, if we're in a situation in which um, societally, there have been injustices. One, one gender has traditionally been in the one down position, 
much more vulnerable. Um, I mean, it's less the case now, but I, I think all of you probably know somebody at least in a uh, trapped in an abusive relationship. You think? Probably every one of us knows, knows somebody like that. Um, what would the ethics of care say um, about like? What, 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 what Tom was saying is much of the care that women have traditionally provided is to men who often don't reciprocate, and they just consume that, that care. So that would harm women as, as a class, not, not just as individuals, but as an entire class. Um, women who are in those sort of situations, I mean, you could have the, the reverse too, where a man is the caring one, the, the woman is the, the uncaring one who's not reciprocating. Um, what happens then is the person, um, their needs aren't being met, so they atrophy over time, you might say. They're not, they're not developing as a person, because in order to develop as a person, you have to have certain needs met. They, can't, they lose the capacity to be genuinely happy. The other problem is um, they begin to take on the perspective of the one who's exploiting them. And see that as, as use the word normal before, right? they, they come to see that as the, the new normal. The other danger that exists with this is what about caring for somebody who's a bad person, who's not just harming you, but harming other people. And, and they, she brings up the example of um, the wife of the commandant at Treblinka, one of the Nazi death camps. She was being nurturing and supportive. Is that what an ethics of care would <coughs> say she ought to do? Probably the world would have been better if she had put poison in the guy's tea, don't you think? Then, you know, supported him through the whole thing. I mean, assuming actually that it would have, been, you know, done something and he wouldn't have just been replaced by some other Nazi bureaucrat. Um, this may be one of the limits of the ethics of care, that it doesn't do well in, in treating these, these situations of violence or, or, or um, harm to other people. So that's where we'll, we'll leave off. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about the ethics of care. Um, but now we go into virtual ethics.